So again, this session is entitled, What Next? And How to Decide What to Study. So, first slide. Oops, my apologies. Sorry, I clicked on the wrong thing on the bottom. Always do that. So at the moment, you guys are most likely studying AAT, okay? And if you're not, you are thinking about moving into AAT or doing something along those sort of lines, okay? Does that, does that ring true, guys? Is there anyone that's sort of different to that? Anyone thinking, you know what, I'm, I'm partway through um, ACCA, some of those lines, and I want to do something so that I'm maybe on the wrong sort of um, webinar. So everyone here should either be at AAT, either at level two, level three, or maybe at level four. Is that right, guys? So in the chat box, can you just drop in there to let me know if that is the right thing? Yep. Okay, absolutely fantastic. Wonderful, excellent. Alex, wonderful, I know you're at level four, brilliant. And you'll recognize that the qualifications that you are studying are this. We have the foundation certificate at level two, we have the advanced diploma at level three, and then we have the professional diploma, which is at level four. Now, uh, when we then take this across into the new, the other qualifications that we tend to sort of look at after AAT, you will notice that at level two, there isn't anything for ACCA, there's nothing for SEMA, and there's nothing for SITFA, and the same can be applied at level three, but you'll notice that at level four, there are qualifications under these professional bodies that sort of sit at the same level. And this is where we start getting this idea of exemptions. Now, in the chat box, can you let me know, have any of you ever come across um, um, exemptions? Rianne, if you want to type into the chat box a question, you're more than able to do so, and I'll, um, I'll answer it sort of whilst we're sort of going through these things. But have people come across this idea of exemptions? Has anyone ever mentioned it to you? Yep. Yep, thank you, Annie. Yep. Wonderful. And what it basically means is if you do the level four AAT professional convocation, if you decide to move on to, let's say, ACCA, you wouldn't have to sit the knowledge exams. You get exemptions from them. You still have to pay a bit of money to ACCA for the privilege, okay? The only organization that doesn't charge you at the moment is over here, is SIPFA. So you'll pay the exemptions. You'll actually start at level five with the skills papers and then move your way through to the professional papers. Does that... Does that make sense, guys, before I sort of move on, the idea of exemptions? I will come back to it in a little bit as we go through things, but the idea of exemptions allowing you to sort of bypass certain qualifications, sort of exams, does that make sense? Yeah? Wonderful. Okay, that's good to know. Fantastic. So, what we're going to take on board, and this, this slideshow we're going to sort of distribute and send back to you um, afterwards, so you'll have this in front of you, both the annotated version I've got here, but also the clean copy. If we take AAT, for example, and there's a reason I put this slide in, I know we're thinking about what we do next. However, I did want to spend a little bit of time. I do know some individuals were coming at this at level two, level three, or level four. And if we go back to this slide here, if you're coming in at university, okay, which tends to mean you're at level six, if you've got a degree, you will probably get exemptions that take you up to that. So you'll get exemptions from level two, level three, level four, and probably some from level five that sit inside this band here, okay? You'll always need to go back and talk to your individual professional body, whether it be ATCA, SEMA, or SIFA, to find out exactly which exemptions you get, because they do vary from university to university. But the idea is that your prior learning is recognized, now, again, I've put this slide in for individuals who may be partway through their AAT qualification or thinking of doing AAT. And there's a couple of things inside here that are very important to pick up, okay? And this will reflect back all the way through the presentation and it'll make a bit of sense. Right at the end, we'll tie it all together and you'll go, I understand why you did that, James, okay? So the first thing to mention here is that the individual levels, whether it be level two or level three or level four, 
there is a definite sequencing of how you should be taking the papers or approaching them in what sort of order you should be doing them, okay? This isn't to make it any easier or any harder, unfortunately. This is just to keep the information that is recognized as the assumed knowledge from one paper that flows into the next paper. So if we do, for example, at level two, bookkeeping transactions, a number or amount of that content flows into bookkeeping controls, which then, funny enough, flows into elements of costing, which you will then use collectively to approach your synoptic assessment, and then you'll use your computerized accounting software afterwards. And the same thing applies from level three. Advanced bookkeeping naturally flows into final accounts prep, which then flows into management accounts costing. Indirect tax is a little bit separate, but then these four papers automatically flow into the synoptic assessment. Although next year, as of January 18, the synoptic assessment will not have any indirect, indirect tax content inside that. Okay, I know that was useful for um, uh, Jessica a little bit earlier uh, when we're sort of uh, talking. Now, level four, okay, again, is ever so slightly different in a sense of I've noticed that the synoptic assessment sits right up here before we do our option papers. So, can I just say it's limited companies? Should be the first one that you approach, and it tends to have a bit of a bad press, unfortunately, because it's a bit of a, a larger syllabus. But it naturally flows into your budgeting paper, which then flows into your decision controls, and then your synoptic exam covers a bit more plus those three modules. And then we tend to recommend you leave your options afterwards, okay? And which options you choose, strangely enough, will have a bit of an impact on what you do or how you move into the professional qualification afterwards. Now, on the chat box, does anyone have any idea as to why the options you choose are important in terms of how they link in to the potential qualification you do afterwards? Anyone got any ideas? Tax will help with ACCA. Alex, you're exactly right. Some management accounts. Mike, you're exactly right. There's, a, there's a, one of the options inside um, AAT, sort of credit management. It's definitely more sort of management accounts uh, and that kind of stuff. You're exactly right. Anyone else? Anyone else brave enough to sort of put a 10 pennies, two pennies worth in there to understand why it's important? It turns out Mike has just made a really good point there, guys, and I hope you can see that. Okay, Mike has just said, quite rightly, you can get exemptions from them, and I'll come back to this a little bit later. But Mike, you are spot on there, pal. Really good. In terms of SITFA, if you do A80 Level Four, you will naturally get um, exemptions from um, three papers: the financial accounting, management accounting, and the company financial reporting papers. However, if one of the options you choose to do is actually audit, you get an additional exemption inside SIPFA. So the reason why I laid this sort of slide out in front of us here is I appreciate, you know, a couple of you might be at level two and a couple of you might be at level three. And some of you I appreciate are at level four, but it's worthwhile starting to think about, right, if I want to do this professional qualification after level four, which option papers should I be thinking about sitting and how are they going to help me make that transition into my next professional qualification? So if we looked at sort of um, SEMA, for example, this goes to something that Alex said a second ago, if one of your options was tax, there's not a huge amount of tax inside the SEMA syllabus. And where there is tax inside the SEMA syllabus, it is not linked to um, the current financial acts uh, or the rates that sort of sit inside the UK um, economy is sort of more sort of um, sort of more theoretical taxation. So actually, you're not going to be able to sort of take that knowledge you've learned at AAT and bring it through into SEMA. Okay, does that make sense, guys? Before we sort of move on a little bit, can you see why it's important um, to sort of have that understanding of what what you what you are, you are planning on doing and how it links into what you might do afterwards? Yeah. 
Excellent. Okay, wonderful. I'm, I'm glad you're getting a little bit of benefit from this already. Okay, so if we go over the page, and this is the first time, so this is the first qualification we're going to talk about. So I'm going to spend a bit of time now talking about ACCA. Now, today is Friday the 24th of um, November. We are terribly close to my annual vacation, which I'm rather excited about. Um, but we're also getting close towards Christmas. But the reason I mentioned today's date is because this session is recorded, I don't want people to come back to me and say, James, this syllabus has changed. Because as of today, this is exactly correct in terms of the syllabus for ACCA. We are, however, changing ACCA next year, and I'll go into this in a little bit more detail in a second. But predominantly, how the ACCA qualification is structured is we have what I refer to our sort of skills papers, we have our professional, essential and professional options. We also do at the front here have our knowledge papers, which are F1, F2, and F3. But luckily, if you were to sit AAT level four, you get exemptions from these three papers. So you won't have to sit those examinations. Okay? Again, you will have to pay for those exemptions at how much the, the entry exam entry cost is, typically somewhere between, I think it's around about sort of um, 50 to 55 pounds. So you'll pay that and get exemptions, and you will naturally start your ACCA journey at the skills papers. Okay? We have corporate law, we have performance management, we have audit and assurance, we have financial management, we have taxation, and we have financial reporting. And you'll notice that they aren't actually in order. So I haven't gone F4, F5, F6, F7, F8, and F9. And there's a reason for that, and we'll come back to that on the next slide as I show you how to sequence your papers. But F4, corporate law, this is sort of um, a module that develops your skills in the understanding of the general legal framework, some legal areas relating to business, recognizing the need to seek further legal advice when necessary, and it complements um, papers F7 and F8, so the link between those two. F5, this is about management accounting techniques uh, in quantitative and quantitative information around planning, decision making, performance evaluation, and control. F6, taxation, doesn't take a genius to figure out that that is about taxation systems, um, single companies, uh, individuals, and groups of companies. Then financial reporting, this is all about applying the accounting standards and a theoretical framework in the preparation of the financial statements. Audit and assurance, again, doesn't take a genius to figure out that that's all about audit and assurance, funnily enough. And then financial management, this is about um, sort of the skills expected of a finance manager, all about affecting investments, financing, dividend policy control, all those kinds of stuff. The way that ACCA is structured as an, ex as an organization in terms of examinations, F4 is a computer-based exam that you can sit whenever you want to sit it. Okay? There are no windows for these exams. You sit it whenever you want to sit it, and it is a completely multiple choice question examination, okay? Where the pass mark for that exam is 50%. So when I say multiple choice questions, there'll be a question and a set of answers, and you would have to select the one that is the correct one to do. When we then move on to the rest of the skills papers, which at the moment are called F5 through F9, these are now becoming computer-based exams from 2018. So the next exam window, and now four of them, you sit exams in either March, June, September, or December. They are becoming computer-based exams, which are three and a quarter hours in duration. And they are split between multiple choice questions and long form questions. So in this computer-based exam, you will be given a series of multiple choice questions where there's a question and you have to select the answer. But there will also be some longer form questions where you're asked to write into a Word document or Excel spreadsheet type document the answers. Okay? Pass mark for these exams? 50%. Okay? Just in the chat box, are you all with me so far? Does that make sense so far, guys? 
Yep. Okay. So where you've moved from AAT, where sort of the, the pass mark was 70%, we've actually seen a little slight drop um, in terms of the pass mark for ACCA. But the, the quid pro quo is that the syllabus, um, or syllabus is, however you want to say it, are considerably larger than AAT, unfortunately. Um, uh, so it's so nice. Nicole, you just said the internet stopped working. Yep, I'm recording this and I'm going to share the slides so you can listen to this all back a little bit later. So don't worry about that. Okay? Now, the nice thing about ACCA is once you have done these qualifications or these exams, F4 through to F9, you actually get awarded something called the ACCA Advanced Diploma in Accounting and Business. So you get a qualification after sitting those examinations, which is quite nice. You then also have the ability at this point to go to an organization or university called Oxford Books and say, I would quite like to get a BSc honors degree in applied accounting. And what they will do is you need to opt in before sitting and passing F7, F8, and F9. And what Oxford Books will do is they'll take your score from this exam your score from that exam, your score from that exam, and ask you to do an additional um, little sort of word, uh, sort of dissertation report, and should that be of a sufficient level, you will then get a degree in applied accounting at this stage in your ACCA journey. Okay? Alongside these qualifications, you'll also have to do the ACCA, um, they call it the Ethics and Professional Skills Module which is about 30 hours of online learning with a little test at the end of it. But ACCA are the only organization at the moment that offer, at this stage, the ability for you to then get a degree. Okay? So you'll sit and you'll be part with your ACCA qualification. You'll also get a degree at the same time. So after F9, you'll have the ACCA Advanced Diploma in Accounting and Business and potentially a BSc Honours Degree in Applied Accounting. So you take that and you go, aren't I a clever little young person, which of course you are, and you move on to the next part of your ACCA journey, which at the moment is your professional. You have some essential papers, P1, P2, and P3, and then you have your option papers, P4, P5, P6, and P7, and you choose two of those four. So you have in total five exams to sit. Now, ACCA is changing its syllabus, and by the time you guys get to this sort of level, Okay, they are changing it so that P1 and P3 are actually merging to become a paper in its own right. So the new syllabus as of September 2018 will see something called the Strategic Business Leader Examination, which in old money is P1 and P3. You'll then have Strategic Business Reporting which is pretty much the same as what P2 is now, and then you'll move on and choose two of your four options. So actually we're going from five exams at the strategic level, the professional level, down to four. This, these exams used to be three and a quarter hours in duration. The strategic business leader is now gonna become a four hour exam with a 50% pass mark, and again, they are sitting, sit, sat, sorry, they are paper-based exams, they're not computer-based. They may move to become computer-based in the future, but at the moment they're computer-based, and they are sat in one of the four exam windows that I mentioned before in the uh, March, June, September, or December, okay? So by the time you get to these, these exams, unless you've got a university um, exemption to take you straight into them, you'll be looking at strategic business leader and strategic business reporting as the two exams you do at this part, and then you will choose two of your optional papers um, for yourself. And again, the optional papers are sat in one of the four exam windows. They are three and a quarter hours. They are paper-based exams. And they are all what we refer to as long-form questions. So at the professional or strategic level, as it will be called now, there are no multiple-choice questions. Okay? Now, in terms of ACCA, does that make sense, guys? Alex, when you say, is that worth doing, what do you mean by that question? Sorry, Alex. No, good question there. So the, the strategic business reporting exam is still 
three and a quarter hours long. There's going to be a slight change in the P2 syllabus or the, the, the syllabus for that, uh, but not a huge, a huge difference. Um, the only one that's changed is the Strategic Business Leader exam, which is almost like the ACCA's case study exam. Um, that's becoming four hours in duration um, because they're sort of merging two syllabuses. Um, is that okay? So, Alex, you made a question. You had a question earlier. Do you want to just um, drop it back in again? Sorry, the diploma option. What, what do you mean by that, Alex? Sorry. We'll, we'll sit here in silence while Alex types frantically quickly in the background. Yeah, poor Alex. I'm sorry, Alex. Mm -hmm. Okay, whilst Alex is, 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 is typing that, imagine you've gone through ACCA, so you've done um, F4 through to uh, F9, and you've got your ACCA Advanced Diploma in Accounting and Business, then you upgraded it, or uh, got the degree at the same time, then you moved on to your strategic level exams, whether they are P1, P2, P3, or whether they are the new strategic business leader or strategic business, strategic business reporting, whenever you sit them, and your option papers. After you've done those, you submit your professional experience, PER, which shows you've done three years worth of, of, of sort of applied work in the workplace. You will get your ACCA initials after your name. You also have the ability, at that point, to go to somebody, a university called the University of London, and say, I'm a clever young person, look what I've done. I would like to actually get a master's in professional accountancy. And the University of London will set some criteria similar to Oxford Book set around the dissertation and checking the scores of the exams you sat here at the beginning and award you a master's after you've done additional sort of dissertation. So ACCA at the moment, as of the 24th of November, is the only professional body that actually links into um, universities to have to, to give you sort of additional um, qualifications so Alex when you say the diploma option it doesn't take more the, the, the diploma option you get it anyway so you don't say I want to do the diploma when you finish these mini these sort of these six exams you will get the diploma by virtue of doing those six exams you get it anyway a lot of individuals don't realize that and they think that actually in terms of ACCA, I need to do the entire qualification to become a qualified accountant. Well, you do, but if you stopped partway through, what ACCA have done is they've chunked their, their qualification down into two parts to give you, you know, if you did, for example, up to F9 and went, you know what, I don't fancy carrying on with this because I'm just struggling to balance this whole work-life study ballot thing, you still walk away with um, a qualification you can put on your CV. And they're the only, organ well, they're the only organization who give the degrees but as you'll see in a second, as I go to the next slide, or the slide after, SEMA do something similar as well. So, that's ACCA. Any, any questions on ACCA whilst we're sort of still on this slide? No? Excellent. I hope that has been useful, guys. Okay, one final thing, just to leave you with, before we sort of move on to SEMA, is when you do move into ACCA, it is rather important that you think about structuring how you attack and approach your papers. Ignoring the fact that you won't have to do F1 and F2 and F3 because of your AAT exemptions, okay, we tend to recommend that you do your F papers in this order. So you go F4, F5, F9, F6, F8. And then the first P paper, or first strategic paper you do, will be P2, or in the case of September onwards, the strategic business reporting. And the reason for this is a lot of these papers, the, 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 the more advanced papers, so from the squiggly line to the right, are based on assumed knowledge. Now, if I told you that the strategic business reporting exam, somewhere between 30 to 35% of the exam, is based on knowledge you will have developed in F7. So if you can keep that information right at the forefront of your mind, it's better than having to go back a couple of years ago and sort of say, what did I learn at F7 and how did I bring that forward? Once you've done P2, if you fancy doing audit as one of your options, funny enough, again, about 30% of P7 comes out of the P2 syllabus content. F6 leads directly into P6 
So you've got baby taxation into advanced taxation. And again, all those, although because P1 and P3 are becoming this new strategic business leader paper, you want you know, 20 to 25% of P5 is covered in these two syllabuses here. So it's really important that when you move into, if you do decide to do ACCA, you take a bit of a second and think about how you stretch your papers to keep the assumed knowledge at the forefront of your mind as you move through these papers. Is that okay, guys? Yeah, and again, I will share these slides with you. And again, you'll have all my contact details on this. And whether you decide to, whichever training provider you decide to go with, I'll always be here, or we'll always be here to give you a bit of advice and guidance on how to tackle the ordering of your papers. Okay, right, wonderful. So let's move on to the next professional body. And we're going to start now with SEMA. Now, SEMA is much more of a recognized qualification for individuals who want to be a management accountant, okay? It's even in the name of the business, funny enough, is the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants. So by definition, if you are um, you know, wanting to work in industry or the NHS or a, a sort of private PLC business for the rest of your life, it tends to be the one that's sort of you know, recognized as being, giving you the skill to be that management accountant, okay? And the way that the qualification is structured is we have an operational level, a management level, and a strategic level. But if you think back to our slide earlier, which was here, oops, my apologies, gone one too far, we do have a SEMA certificate level, and that sits directly, give me a second, we find it here. This is our SEMA certificate level. But again, you get exemptions from this um, qualification. But the reason I refer to it, okay, and the same reason that I've left these papers on the ACCA slide is because if you do do F7, you need to ask for content that would have been an F3, even if you get the exemptions from it because they lead into that paper, okay? So any training provider worth half their salt will give you access to the assumed knowledge recordings that link into the paper that you're sitting. So when we look at SEMA, E1, which is enterprise pillar, and that's looking at sort of what really interesting things like that in a second, underneath the enterprise pillar actually sits the BA1 syllabus, okay? Underneath P1 sits our BA2 syllabus. Underneath F1 sits our BA3 syllabus, and actually, BA4, which is our law and other things, sits across the whole lot actually because it's just a nice sort of standalone um, individual module. So again, the reason I've shown you that is not to show you what, you what you could have won, if that makes sense, but to give you an understanding that as you build up this qualification, so as you move all the way through to right to the end, there are individuals, that are, there are assumed knowledge papers that move on and move on and move on, okay? And again, you need to, just because you've got an exemption, from these qualifications, the AAT syllabus is not the same as the ACCA syllabus at F1, F2, and F3, and it's not the same as the SEMA certificate syllabus at BA1 through to BA4. So it's also always worthwhile saying to someone, look, I'm studying E1, guys. Can I have a look at some of the BA1 recordings to make sure that I've got the right assumed knowledge in my head before I move on? Okay? So, enterprise pillar. So here we have... Enterprise pillar, you'll notice that because it's got E3, E2, and E1. We'll start at E1 and work up. This is sort of an introduction to organizations. It's about how you manage the finance function. It's operations management. It's a bit of marketing. It's some human resources. When you move to E2, you're starting to look at strategic management, global environments, the human aspects of the organization, managing relationships, even change through projects. <coughs> Excuse me. And then E3, this is sort of higher level interacting with the organization's environment, evaluating strategic position and strategic options, leading change, implementing strategy, and basically being top dog in the organization. The P pillar, or performance pillar, at P1, this is very much sort of cost accounting systems, budgeting, short-term decision making, all that kind of stuff. And you'll notice that in this, there's quite a lot of AAT content that goes straight into the performance pillar. P2, 
you've got your cost planning, um, some long-term decision making, managing management control and risk, and then P3 at the top, higher level again, the identification, classification and evaluation of risk, the response to strategic risk, internal controls to managing risk, um, managing risk around cash flows. So lots of stuff that sort of, sort of sit under that sort of idea of risk management. And then finally, but not last, no, not least, sorry, our financial pillar. So we start at F1. We are looking here around um, the regulatory environment for financial planning, reporting, um, financial accounting, management of working, management of working capital, cash, um, that sort of stuff. Advanced financial reporting F2 is sources of long-term finance, uh, financial reporting, and then the analysis of performance and position. And at the top, your financial strategy is your formulation of financial strategy, uh, financing and dividend decisions, and then corporate finance. Okay? And the way that each opera, or each level sort of is created is you have three, what we refer to as OT exams, and then one case study. Okay? Now, in the chat box, does anyone want to hazard a guess as to what the pass mark is for one of these OT exams? So E1, F1, P1, or E2, F2, P2, or E3, etc. Anyone has a guess what the pass mark is? What only, 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 only marks you need to get to pass? There you go, that's absolutely fantastic. So you're exactly right, uh, A. Lowman. Um, the CMSA, you need to get a scaled score of 100 out of 150, which in old money is approximately 70%. And the OT exams are computer-based exams that you sit whenever you want to sit at a Pearson View exam center, which some of you may already be aware of because you would have done your driving theory test at those centers. You have 90 minutes to sit that exam and you get 60 questions and they are referred to as objective test questions. So an objective test question in the chat box, does anyone understand or anyone know what objective test actually means? I think that's fine, I'm glad you understand, that's okay. No. Okay, so when SEMA use the expression objective test, what they mean is a question that has a predetermined answer. So what you'll get is you'll get a, a, a selection of questions that could be either multiple choice, they could be drag or drop, they could be put these in order, they could be identified on this graph by clicking where the lines cross. There will also be a little bit of computation where you have to insert an answer to do that to do those more places, but what it will not be is long form subjective questions where you can answer um, and get method marks and sort of you know argue your answer. It's either right or it is unfortunately guys wrong on the other side of things. Okay? So you will get 90 minutes within which to sit 60 of these objective test questions, or, uh, uh, sort of objective questions, and you'll need to get a scale score of 100 out of 150, okay? And only once you've completed the three OT papers at each level, will you be allowed to sit your case study at each level. And the case studies, are sat in one of four exam windows at SEMA open up. And we have just come out of one because they have exam windows in February, May, August, and November. Okay? Now, the case study exams, again, are computer-based examinations, but they are structured slightly differently because there are what we refer to as long form questions. And you'll get between three and five long form questions. Now, with the case study, six weeks or seven weeks before the opening of the exam window, they release a pre-seen piece of information, which is 20 odd pages of A4 on a made up organization, which bears an uncanny resemblance to a real organization in the real world, funny enough, but you'll get information on the um, 
profit loss account, balance sheet, company information, management structure, marketing, competition, environment, market, sector, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in the case study, you will get what are known as triggers and then tasks. So you'll get a bit more information, which is a trigger on the organization, and then you'll be set a task or a question based on that trigger. And you'll be expected to bring the information you have learned from E1, F1, and P1, or if you do management case, E2, P2, F2, into those answers to pull it together, okay? And you will get, for the case study, case study exam, three arrows, and this is where it gets interesting and slightly exciting. If you're sitting in exam, uh, or what they refer to them as a variant, with four questions in, you will notice that four goes into three hours perfect, perfectly in terms of 45 minutes. So if you're on question one and you've been asked a question and you're typing away and you're loving question one because it's on information that you've actually advised, which is always quite helpful, after your 45 minutes, you will automatically get kicked out of that question onto the next question. So the exam itself, the computer exam itself, actually self-manages your time for you. Okay? So the case to the exams, there are four windows every year. There are three hours in duration. You'll get either four or five questions that are timed out. They are long form questions based on the pre scene that has released six or seven weeks previously, and you're given triggers and tasks. Now, anyone in the chat box, anyone has a guess what the pass mark is for the case study guys? Okay, and he's on seventy percent. Okay, anyone else want to go higher or lower than that? Now you're far. Oh, Liam, fantastic, Mike. It's fifty percent. Okay, so we've got a nice range here. Okay, what Seema say again is you need to get a scaled score of eighty out of one hundred and fifty, which in old money is around about sixty percent. Okay. And the way that it's going to structure, so there are four exams, three OTs, one case at this level, four exams at the management level, and four strategic. Okay? But again, you'll notice, if you're sort of eagle eye looking at the slides, after each level, you get awarded a qualification in its own right. So if you stop to operational level, i.e. you did E1, P1, F1, and then the case to the exam, you would get the SEMA diploma in, a man in management accounting. If you stopped at management level after you've done operational and then E2, P2, F2 and case study, you'd get the SEMA advanced diploma in management accounting. And if you, well, you won't stop at strategic level because that's when you get your initials after your name and you become um, a qualified accountant. Uh, guys will become a qualified management accountant. But again, in the same way that ACCA have split their qualification into sort of um, recognizable smaller qualifications, the same thing happens inside SEMA, okay? Now, before I move on to the next slide with SEMA and sort of how to structure that, does that make sense? Or do you guys have any questions on SEMA as a qualification? Thank you, Nicole. It's good to hear. Excellent, Danny, wonderful. Anyone else? No, Jacqueline, that's wonderful, thank you. Great, glad to help Mike. Excellent, okie dokie. So, in the same way that with ACCA, there's an order within which to do your um, papers, the same thing can be said for SEMA. Okay, and I'll just show you here on this slide, and I'll bring it to life to make it a bit more um, relevant. So, you will come into SEMA if you've got AAT level four here. If you stop, um, at AAT level 2 or level 3, you'll have to do the certificate level of SEMA, but let's work on the assumption that we all go through all of our AAT journey together, and you come out of it with your AAT initials, you'll start at operational level, and you'll start off by doing E1, then F1, and you'll leave P1 to that position there. And the reason for that is that P1 is largely recognized as the lead paper for the operational case study. And what I mean by that is if your examination 
had four questions, you will probably find that one will be focused on F1 content, one on E1 content, and you'll get two questions that have P1 content. So it makes sense as you move into your operational case study to keep this information fresh in your brain. Okay? And then as you move on to management level, you flow out of case study into E2, then F2, and then leave P2 at the end for exactly the same reason that this is the lead paper or recognized as the lead paper for management case study. And again, if you had four um, questions, you'd have one on E2 content, one on F2 content, and then primarily two on P2 content. Okay? With me so far, guys, does that make sense so far? Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, now this is where it gets slightly interesting and exciting. Okay, you'll notice those eagle eyes ones you already will have noticed that it goes P1 to P2. So, logic you'd think that would be P3, but it's not. E3 is your lead paper at a strategic case study. Okay. And we recommend that after case study management, you do P3 next. And there's a reason for that, guys, is because these three papers together are heavy on your performance pillar. So you've done all of P2, you've done an exam that's 50% P2, then you're moving on to P3. So you're keeping that knowledge as close to the front of your mind, as in, in all that lovely short-term memory stuff, right at the forefront of your mind, you're past P3, You'll move on to F3, you'll then move on to E3, you'll see your case study, and you'll be a very happy individual over here because you'll be qualified, okay? So the one thing I want you to take out of this, guys, is irrespective of who you go and decide um, to, to sort of study with, um, try if you can to order your papers. Now, Mike's made a very good point there, guys. He sort of said, the college course he's looking at to enroll on doesn't follow this order. Is it imperative? Mike, no, it's not imperative, okay? It really isn't. However, if, for example, if you did it in this order, if you did P1, F1, and E1, and then operational case, I just needed to make sure, Mike, that as you move into your operational case, you go right back to your P1 content and bring it all the way forward to the forefront of your brain. Is that okay, Mike? So once you've passed P1, if it's the first paper you do, do not put your books in the cupboard, you know, or underneath the table to keep the table nice and straight, collecting dust. You need to keep those books out, Mike, especially for P1 and then P2 and E3 as you go through the papers, to keep that information at the forefront of your brain. Okay? Super. Right, so before we move on to SITFA, which is the last one that we've got uh, time for today before we sort of open it up. Has anyone got any questions on SEMA? No? Okay, wonderful. So, SIPFA. Now, I'm going to put a little caveat out here, guys. As an organisation, and you put a notice from the, sy the symbols down here at the bottom, HTFT don't deliver SIPFA. So I've had to learn this over the last sort of couple of weeks um, so I can pass some information to you um, that makes you make an awful lot of sense. Right, okay, so, um, SIPFA. There is, as I mentioned before, inside SIPFA, an AAT fast track route. So you will get exemptions, if you do your AAT level four, you will get exemptions from this paper, this paper, and this paper. And if you have chosen external audit as your AAT or one of your AAT options, you will get that exemption as well. Now, SIFA is the convocation, and it's, it's, a, it's a massive foundation for a career in public finance. This is, this is all, or primarily, public finance. So it's the effective and efficient management of public money. Okay, so if you're sitting there and currently in sort of AAT level three thinking, you know what, SIPFA is where I want to be. SIPFA is what I want to do. I'm not changing. Make sure that when you choose your AAT options at level four, audit is one of those because it gives you this exemption here. Okay, and as I mentioned before, SIPFA are the only organization at present where they, they provide these exemptions to you 
at no cost to yourself. So with ACC and SEMA, you'll have to pay for your exemptions. SITFA are the only organization who give you this for free. There's no cost to you, which is always quite nice, isn't it? Okay. So the qualification itself is built up through the professional certificate level. But again, if you've got your AAT level four, you'll get these lovely things called exemptions from that, which will leave you, by my calculation, eight exams to sit before you become a fully chartered public finance accountant with the CPFA status. So we've got corporate law and governance, sorry, corporate governance and law, my apologies, financial management, taxation, strategy and policy development, public service, financial reporting, business and change manage, management, and then our strategic level, we've got the strategic public finance and strategic case study, okay? In terms of the examinations for um, SITFA, and I'll cover all of them because I appreciate some of you might come into the SITFA and um, not have chosen audit as one of your AAT options by mistake. Um, the papers, so FA, MA, um, AA and um, CGL, these are two hours in duration, these examinations, okay? So you've got, oops, my apologies, don't happen there. Pen's gone funny. So two hours, two hours, two hours, two hours in duration. Okay. The rest of the examinations are 2.5 hours. Okay. But all of these examinations are all sat online. And this is where it gets quite interesting about SIFR. And I, as I read this, I, 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 I was quite intrigued by this. So you sit them online, but you sit them at a place of your choice. So it could be at home, or it could be at work. And the exam will be invigilated remotely. So you need to have on your computer a webcam and a microphone. I thought it was absolutely fascinating. So at the exam time, you'll log into your SIFR system, and the invigilator will take you through what you need to do and how you need to do it. And there are four exam windows per year to sit these exams in. So you've got March, June, September, and December. Okay? Now, has anyone done any research on SIFR and, and, and has, has anyone got an idea of what the pass marks are for these examinations? Because they do actually slightly vary, which I find quite interesting. No? No one's, done, no one's done any research. Oh, okay, well, I'll tell you what, I'll put you out in Mujri then and let you know because I'm a nice person. So financial accounting and management accounting, these two exams are 60% and you've got two hours to do them, as I said, and you're going to have 60 multiple choice questions to sit in those exams, okay? Then all of the other exams, every other exam, as a pass mark of 50%, but they vary in terms of how they structure their exam. So the audit and assurance examination, for example, you have 40 multiple choice questions, and then four short form questions. And then when you get to um, company financial reporting, for example, you have 25 multiple choice questions, six short form questions, and two essay questions and it changes all the way through the qualification now i'm not going to go through them one by one because on the next in a couple of slides later i've got some useful links embedded into this document which i'll circulate to you which you can click on and find out this information for yourself <coughs> but it's interesting to realize and sort of understand before you make this sort of leap into it that the individual qualifications or the individual exams are ever so slightly different but the headline fact to take from this is Four exam windows online at a place of your choice, which I find wonderful, um, invigilated remotely, but varying levels of um, pass marks from 60 to 50 percent. Okay, and is everyone happy with that before I move on to uh, the strategic level of SIFA? And Liam's just missed that because the file I went off. Don't worry, Liam, I'm recording this so you can go back and listen to my dulcet tones a little bit later. I promise you that, not a problem at all. Okay, so 
Let's say you're partway through SIF and you've done your professional certificate or got the exemptions and you're, you finish your professional diploma because you're a clever little person, as we all know you all are, and you find yourself at strategic level. So here we are, strategic level. Now, slightly different for the examinations here, guys. They are still 50% pass rate. That's fine, etc. Brilliant. But these now are the public sector finance. This is a three hour exam. Okay. And then the strategic case study, okay, is actually 270 minutes. So, how many hours is 270 minutes, guys? Four and a half hours. I'll tell you what, the better lay to take water into that exam, otherwise you're going to dehydrate. That's a long time and it's so you've got a four and a half hour exam. That's incredible. Absolutely incredible. Now, these exams are paper based and you sit them in the exam hall. Okay. But they're only available in two of the four exam windows. So you need to sit them in either June or December okay so you can start seeing now why it's really important that you sort of you know where you guys are in terms of you know you know where you are in terms of your AAT journey or you come out of university and you know what exemptions you might get it's really important that as you make a plan you understand where you're going to be going to so you can understand how to get to there in the most efficient and effective manner okay so and again, so the, the studio public finance and the case study exams, they are all essay questions um, that might be incorporated and actually include real financial statements. Okay. Now, before I move on, has that any, anyone got any questions on SIPFA or the examinations or the papers that sort of sit inside SIPFA? No. Okay. Wonderful. I'm glad to hear that. Okay. So, next slide, and I'm going to share this with you because it's really important that you have this information, guys. This is purely just a slide that's got some links on that I think are going to be very, very useful for you to have a little look at. Okay. I'm a firm believer that you cannot make the best decision for yourself until you have all of the information in front of you, and whichever decision you make, guys and girls. Um, I'll come to that question in a second, Alex. Which, whichever decision you make after AAT or whichever decision you decide to move on, whichever qualification, it'll be the right decision for you as long as you have had all the information in front of you. Now, the worst question you can go and ask anyone who's a qualified accountant, okay, is which professional qualification should I study? Because I guarantee you, 10 out of 10 times, they will tell you to study the qualification that they studied. The questions you need to be asking yourself are, where do I want to be? What skills do I want to develop? And ask the people around you, how has what you've learned in your qualifications impacted your working life? Have you used what you've learned in your working life? And start looking at the syllabuses in detail yourself. Have a look at the individual qualifications, the papers, what you'll learn, and map it against not only what you do now, but what type of job you want to do in five, ten years' time. Okay? And once you've had all those discussions and all that thinking, you can then make the most informed, correct decision for yourself. And after you've done that, it will not be the wrong decision. It will be exactly the right decision just for you. Okay? Now, Alex has popped a question in here that says, the qualified accountant circles, does that mean you can do extra exams for the additional qualifications after, say, ACCA? But what, what do you mean by that, Alex? So you're sort of saying you, you, you want to sort of transfer from ACCA to SEMA, for example, or from ACCA to SIPFA? Okay, give me a second. Let me just go to the last slide. I love this interaction here. I get told off by, by students not doing things properly. So I'm on, on the back last slide, Alex. So what's on? The 
If you want to unmute yourself, Alex, I'll be more than happy to do that. Yeah, whilst Alex is thinking of that question, um, has anyone else got any additional questions that they want to sort of pop into the chat box uh, whilst I'm online now to answer? We've got um, sort of, you know, two or three minutes. Right, so... Hi. Go on, go on, sorry, go on, heard him talk. Ines, is that you? Hi, hi sorry, yeah, it is me. I haven't got a chat box on my screen for some reason, yeah. but I have a question. No, Can I yeah, ask, please? Uh, all the slides, will these be provided uh, to our email? Will you email them across? Yes. Or? So I'm going to email the um, Students Network a copy of this recording, the blank slides, and then the annotated slides that I've made. Okay, and the other question is, uh, can I ask, if you want to um, go from, for instance, you started your SEMA level one, yes. and then you want to go on to a ACCA, how yes. that transfer is possible, please? It is possible. What you need to do on an individual basis is talk to ACCA and find out what exemptions they will give you for doing the SEMA, SEMA, SEMA level so far, okay? You will probably find, because I've seen people do this, you don't get a huge number of exemptions from going from SEMA to ACCA, but you do get a few from going from ACCA to SEMA. Is that all right? Okay, thank you. No, absolute pleasure. Good question, really good question. Okay, so um, let's go back to um, A. Lamb's question. Do I need to stop paying my AAT membership once you're an ACCA member? Um, you, you, you are, I wouldn't recommend stopping. Uh, and the reason for that is you, if you stop paying your membership, you're not allowed to use your um, MAAT initials after your name, um, but AAT do run some very, very good CPD courses that give you sort of 30%, 30, 30 hours per year. So you can stop paying, um, but if you want to have the initials after your name, you need to keep paying it. Um, I'm afraid, sorry to say that. Um, Liam, yep, yeah, contact details will be on the slide there, on the last slide, which is like two from here, so the contact details will be, will be shared. Um, so, and you can email me, phone me, um, as long as you don't put my phone number on Facebook, um, I'm more than happy to sort of answer questions um, that anyone might have afterwards. Um, Alex, I'm still waiting for you to sort of, a, a, sort of ex go on, I can hear you now, so we go on, carry on. Hello, sorry, my computer froze, so I decided right. to call in instead. So in, on that slide that we're looking at now, yeah. next is the strategic public finance and the public service financial reporting. It's got two little circles, yep. and then underneath it says qualified accountants need to take just two modules. So does that mean you can boost, say, your ACCA or CMA with SIPSOP as like an additional with the yes. So, so for example, if, if you were um, ACCA qualified, okay, mm -hmm. you would get exemptions from all of the affiliate member, the professional certificate, and the professional diploma at SIPFA. You would just need to sit the two exams at the top at the strategic level to get your SIPFA qualification as well. All oh, right. Okay. And, and funny enough, people do that a lot. And actually, you know what people do as well? And I haven't put it on this slide yet because um, I wasn't asked to cover it. But obviously, there's another um, professional body called ICAW, mm -hmm. the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales. And that, that's become a chartered accountant, so we have the initials ACA after your name. Um, you can do a transfer from you know, CMA, ACCA, SIPFA into ACA, but obviously you know, it varies on what exemptions you get and which, which qualifications, which exams you need to sit. Yeah, in terms of ACCA, you would just flip across and sit the last two qualifications, and that's what you need to do. Okay, thank you. It's good, isn't it? So there's lots of different options yeah. there. Uh, lots and lots and lots of options. So it's quite exciting, actually. I kind of wish I'd done this when I was, when I was your sort of age. Um, <laughs> has anyone got any other questions for us whilst we're sort of all online? So if I just go down to... The last slide just to promise just to show liam that i wasn't lying um there are my contact details um please feel free if you have any questions to email me or phone me i'm more than happy to help in any way shape or form answer any questions that you've got um but if you have any other i know other questions all that's left for me to say is thank you for joining i really appreciate your sort of engagement i hope you find it useful um, and have yourself a wonderful weekend. And I will share this, um, this, this video and the contact, the slide details with Siobhan and the network later today. 
So hopefully this will hit your inbox um, at some point next week. And then your job is to then circulate it to all your friends and family who are thinking about becoming accountants so everyone can make the right decision um, how they progress through their qualifications. Okay? Wonderful. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate that. Have yourself a lovely weekend and um, hope to speak to you all guys soon. Take care. Bye.